Well, the JSE is dominated by 40 major stocks, and despite some criticisms of the exchange, it remains one of the most popular segments to invest in. We take a look at what products investors can use to target the sector, and joining us now to discuss this further, of course, Mark Ashton, of whose FinWeek uh, editor, Brian McMillan, Structured Products at Investec, and Ryan Gardner, Global Market Fund Solutions over at RMB. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Well, as I said, uh, the top 40 viewed as a barometer for overall markets. Uh, it's popular because it's uh, the most liquid stocks that we're looking at. We're looking at stocks that have a uh, strong track records. Let's talk about managing your exposure. Sure. I mean, uh, the top 40 index has been a great uh, investment over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, since inception in 1995, it's up over 600%. Uh, even in the last four years, um, after the market fell dramatically in 2008-9, uh, it's up over 100%. So there's definitely um, reason to invest in the top 40 index. And certainly um, for an investor, it's one of the easiest ways to get exposure to the market. That, that bringing to the forefront active versus passive sure. investing right now. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the whole... There's been numerous research and debate with regards to the whole you know, passive management versus active. And clearly the top 40 as a basket of shares is a passive strategy. And the reasons for that is obviously it's, uh, it's cost effective. You want to have and achieve a uh, competitive beta at those prices. And that's the benefit of the top 40, whereas the active managers are seeking the alpha where they want to outperform. Um, a benchmark such as the top 40. Mm -hmm. So maybe a starting point then is, I mean, just anecdotally looking at your client base, I mean, or, or flows within your, your products, how popular is the top 40 product at the moment in terms of, you know, are, in, are South African investors still desperately trying to get exposure to the sector? I think the recent trends, I wouldn't say desperate, <laughs> but uh, I, I think as a, as a core holding, you can see that there, there is that, um, that drive towards the top 40 exposure because, again, um, you can have the core satellite where you have the blend of the active managers as the satellite. Mm. And obviously, being the blue chip stocks, these are the well publicized companies, you're indirectly getting exposure to most of these shares if you've got your own um, stock broking account. So from that perspective, the retail investor, and I think this low return environment, uh, there's been significant cost pressure. Mm. So investors who are cost conscious certainly have looked more towards the, the passive way of accessing the, the top 40 basket. Can you use it as an example of, uh, to getting specific access to resources? I mean, I think that as, as a proxy, I suppose, for the mm. resource index, I mean, I think one of the, when somebody thinks of the top 40, and I know it has materially changed over mm. the last 10 years, people still see us being dominated by BHP and Anglo-American. I mean. Is it used as a proxy for resources or, or are investors savvy enough to know that it's, it's now a broader index? Yeah, I think, I think if uh, investors are looking specifically for resources, there's now you know, ways, ways to get into that. There's Resi 20. Mm -hmm. um, so an investor who's savvy enough to know that he wants resources would go into something like the Resi. And I mean, the Resi's now down uh, 15, 16% this year so far and we've seen some people you know look for interest uh, into that um, on the other side the top 40 index um, we, we find uh, putting out products quite often that uh, you know it's it swings and roundabouts uh, when the market's high people start looking for protection over the mm -hmm. top 40 index so they they start looking for products that offer protection uh, when the market's low they might be coming in and looking for geared products into mm -hmm. the top 40 and certainly the the way that the top 40 is put together and the amount of trade that there is in there, uh, the derivatives that you can write over it, it's, it is the most cost effective way of getting exposure to the market itself. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, you guys have recently brought a new product to market. I mean, what was the motivation for putting that together at this time and what's been the appetite for it? Sure. We, we've got a, a product out at the moment called the Geared Growth. Um, essentially what it does is it, it offers you gearing on the upside of the top 40 index. So uh, if the index is up 10%, the product will go up 15%, so it's one and a half times geared. On the downside, we take the first 15% uh, of the losses. So if the market is down at, after three and a half years, 10%, you get your money back. If it's down 20, you would only lose five. 
Now, what we've seen is we've done a few of these over the last couple of years that the motivations for getting into the product are really people that have been sitting on the sideline for the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. You know, yields have come down very low. People are starting to understand that they have to be in, in the equity market. But to come into the equity market after it's just had this, this massive rise over the last four years, up 100%, um, we're seeing people with a motivation coming in where they, they want that protection on the downside rather than the gearing on the upside. Yeah. Ryan, just yeah. taking a look at the product offering, I mean, you've got local exchange traded funds as well that you've got uh, customers likely to, uh, you know, get exposure to the top 40 through. Uh, we've seen a significant growth in the range of those ETFs that are being offered. 25 are pure equity FT yeah. ETFs, but 13 focused on the top 40 specifically. So how's uh, demand being driven in that direction? Well, the demand for obviously being you know equity centric you know you can get the top 40 exposure and i think just linked to that was on the resources is the fact that 2007 resources was quite a major constituent of the of the index um, whereas now currently because of the weaker performance of the resource sector it's now only about 27 percent so you've got that other 73 odd percent is not resources so you're getting fantastic performance coming through from the industrials and and financials um, you know post the crash so if, in terms of the access, I think that's that's a great way for for investors to to get it. And in the ETF uh, environment, there, obviously being exchange traded, that that's been quite a great avenue for a retail investor to get access to. It's listed on the exchange. You've got the liquidity there, and it's got obviously those great benefits um, for for the retail investor. Well, one of the interesting things, I mean, you, you and I chatted a bit of briefly about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is around the costs associated yes. with these, and you know, Satrix is a well-recognised brand in mm -hmm. South Africa, excellent product for getting investors in. Yes. I mean, one thing I found quite interesting when your presentations recently was the costs associated with your top 40 ETF mm -hmm. makes it one of the most, if not the most, cost-effective way of getting into the product. I mean. Uh, one of the things uh, in the ETF market in South Africa is that the ETF itself or the, the exchange traded product, but from the issuer, is quite cheap. Mm. It's the, the layers of fees that go off. And I mean, I think maybe if both of you'd like to yes. comment on you know, how, how much or how flexible are fees around exchange traded products at the moment? Yes, well, the first fee to look at is obviously the TRs, so the total expense ratio within, within the actual ETF or exchange traded uh, product. And that's the, the cost within that, that actual product. And the, the point is, it's how you access that mm. ETF. It's the actual delivery mechanism of how you, you go about um, investing in that. And obviously, you can go direct via the exchange. And we had the, the um, stock market companies on the um, session before this. And those costs, obviously, dependent on the amounts that you invest, how long your time horizon is. Um, you know, you can go via the stockbroker, that's the first platform, and the other one is via, um, you know, you mentioned your Satrix or ETF SA, which is a specialist ETF um, platform in order to, to access those products. And again, they uh, could add on sort of administration fees ranging from 40 bips to, to 80 bips mm -hmm. uh, as an ongoing fee, whereas obviously if you're buying it by your stockbroker, you're paying the once off buy and sell um, as well as your monthly account. So if, if we look at it, your Let's say your minimum trading, if you're an entry-level retail investor stockbroker, is roughly 50 rand a trade. Mm -hmm. I've seen some aggressive pricing come through the market in the last uh, couple of years. And so buying in and out is, say, approximately 100 rand versus a 50 bips uh, annual management fee uh, via the, an administration platform such as ETFSA. Mm -hmm. And the point is there's a break even. So if you're investing 10,000, it would be better to go the, uh, the fixed route where you're paying a fixed trade per amount. But any smaller amounts than that, you, you've got to calculate and do your homework mm. as an investor. So even though you're buying a, a cheaper strategy, you've just got to do the research of what exactly you're paying to access it. So those are the kind of costs that are being encouraged. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, trend do you see the se uh, you know, setting as we get, I mean, earlier on we were talking about a South African investor community that's becoming a whole lot more educated about financial markets. Uh, how do you see things progressing? What kind of outlook uh, do you have in sight? Sure, I, th I think uh, the, the advent of ETNs, so or exchange traded notes, are gonna see a, a number of different indices being offered, uh, different kinds of, of exchange traded notes where they might be a little bit more actively managed or balanced types of funds. So we, I think what we're going to see is that uh, the banks and the issuers are gonna be putting out a number of different products uh, and saying to the market, this is an easier, quicker way to, to invest uh, for the retail investor and we'll give them a wider range of products at a cheaper price than they might be getting into the, the active managed funds at the moment. We've seen uh, already 
uh, Investex launched uh, two different ETNs, one on the SWIX, which is a, a share-weighted top 40, mm -hmm. uh, and on the top 40, but a, in a total return form. So there's no dividends. They, they reinvest the dividends back into it. And that's just another example of a type of trade. It, it's not very different from, from some of the other ETFs, but it just has a little bit of a twist for those people who don't need dividends, for example. And one of the concerns is that the financial advisor community, I mean, ultimately a lot of the products go through the advisor, mm -hmm. through, through mm -hmm. the advisors. They're not necessarily clued up to what is what products have come to market recently. I mean, they they were very negative. The the passive products initially, I think, there's been quite a big mm -hmm. change there. Um, but there's new products that are <coughs> consistently coming to the market now. I mean. How much e emphasis do you guys put on actually educating the advisor market around what you guys are bringing out? Sure, I mean that, that, that's probably the biggest part of our business mm -hmm. is, is to get that education out there, to get that information to the broker so that they can make inform, informed choices. And because we, we um, some of our products are uh, at a cheaper level, um, we're using that excess funds to actually go out there and make sure that, that the brokers or the IFA markets are actually aware of the product that are out there. Do you think it's fair to say, I mean, one of the cons criticisms of the unit trust industry, I'm not here to knock any industry, but you know, the idea is that a unit trust is something, it's like an insurance product, it's sold, it's not bought. Do you think that using the passive product suite that you guys are, are slowly developing, it's mm -hmm. becoming more of something that's bought rather than sold? If, that may, if, if, the, if the question makes sense. I mean, it's something mm -hmm. that people want rather than that somebody, somebody's incentivized to sell. Yes, I think you know, the, traditionally the retail investor has an exposure to a significant amount of uh, traditional unit mm. trust. Yeah, yes, I mean, there's over 900 uh, available in the market. It's over a trillion mm. worth of assets in that space. So that's been the legacy for the last few decades of how you access traditional investments. Mm -hmm. And once they're becoming more, more savvy and more, um, you know, what they're upskilling themselves in education, and more importantly, the advisor, the role that the advisor plays uh, in accessing these products is, is critical. I think that's from a from a wide perspective, you know, the, one of the best ways to, to get access to. And the idea of gearing, I mean, bringing the gearing mm. into the gearing into the product mix. I mean, I think that's that's innovation, but is it necessarily something that safe for market's ready for? I, th I think it's definitely something the market's ready for. Um, we've seen over the last uh, decade or so, we've seen things like warrants, uh, mm -hmm. single stock futures, and now CFDs. Mm -hmm. uh, the South African investor. Uh, the retail investor has certainly looked for gearing, um, you know, when they invest in, in the market. And certainly the equity culture within South Africa, you know, there is quite a strong uh, equity culture and they have looked to go for gearing. So we offer gearing in what well, we like to say in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, uh, we've got the downside protection. Um, you know, you can't lose more than your investment. Uh, it's, you know, it's not that kind of options. Um, and the ability to provide gearing on top of it really makes sense in, in some cases. You know, you, if you bought a share in, uh, or an option, you expect it, it could double, it could triple, it go, could go up infinitely. Um, whereas something like the top 40, we don't expect it to go, you know, to double in the next year. So why pay for that extra gearing? And so we, we're using things like caps. Uh, like floors, and uh, when you put it into a simple way, and again link it in with that in uh, education, um, gearing is definitely something that we're seeing appetite for.